So the, so the people indicated in red here uh, cont contributed in some capacity uh, to the results I'll be showing today. Um, the, uh, this is the plan of presentations. Contrary to standard Galerkin method, DPG applies uh, to variational formulations that use a non-symmetric functional setting. That is, trial and test space may be different. And that opens up a number of variational formulations you can use. Um, so I will go first through the concept of deriving multiple variational formulations for one and the same problem. I usually try to make a presentation very specific and choose a problem, a model problem that we can use as a, as a basis for our discussions and given the engineering um, audience today, I, I chose the problem that everybody should be familiar with, that is linear elasticity. So we'll use the linear elasticity to go over uh, the concept of multiple variational formulations. Now, multiple variational formulations for elasticity and other problems is not a new concept. Uh, this was an area of very intensive research already in the 70s. You may recall the book by Oden and Reddy, um, published by Springer, I believe, um, the, the yellow cover the, that covers the subject. The difference is that perhaps that those formulations, those derivations in 70s were formal, formal meaning no proofs, whereas now uh, we have a full um, well posedness mathematical theory. Uh, once we discuss the variational formulations, I will uh, uh, provide a very quick refresher of Babushka and Bresci's theory and uh, use it as a starting point to introduce the DPG. DPG can be identified in three different ways, equivalent ways. We talk usually about three hats of DPG as a pattern of Galerkin method with optimal test functions, as minimum residual method, or as a special mixed method. This last characterization actually belongs to Wolfgang, Wolfgang Dahmen, Professor Dahmen and his group. And it is the shortest way to introduce uh, those concepts, and this is what I will do today. After all, we are in Aachen. Uh, once we introduce the concept of those three different formulations and the stabilization provided by them, I will go into the technical subject of using a broken, or sometimes we call it product test spaces. Uh, this is non-standard, and this is responsible for the letter D in DPG, discontinuous. The letter D in DPG corresponds to the use of discontinuous test functions. Trial functions may or may not be discontinuous. They, they, uh, they, they, uh, depends upon the variation formulation you use. So this is probably the most technical subject and yet uh, probably one of the most important subjects in this uh, topics in this in uh, DPG theory. I'll try to explain it as best as I can. Otherwise, I did send you um, a copy of my recently published on, on web lecture notes on mathematical theory of finite elements. And the last chapter there, the last chapter there is all about DPG. Of course, it contains much, much more information that uh, I will cover today. But it doesn't have the numerical examples, and we'll show you some numerical examples today. So as numerical examples, I chose following the choice of the model problem, linear elasticity, and then an extension of this, linear thermal viscoelasticity, a problem that we arrive at by uh, in a project of analyzing um, initiation of cracks in high energy density 
electric insulators uh, in the electric motors. This was uh, part of the dissertation of Federico Fuentes. Federico is now a, an assistant professor at Cornell uh, University. Now, so that's, that's the minimum I would like to cover. If we do have time, I will mention um, a version, a polyhedral version of DPG method that we call polyDPG, and then cover the important subject of discrete least squares implementation of DPG method that enables solution of a very ill-conditioned problem. Okay, so we are starting with multiple variation formulations first. And here is the time harmonic linear elasticity. Everything is complex valued. And we are starting with a Hooke's law, stress uh, as a function of linearized strain. And uh, the elasticity is tensor. Now, uh, this is the standard form. Uh, you can invert for the strain and when you apply the inverse of elasticity tensor to both sides then you have to remember that this tensor is defined only on symmetric guys uh, you can uh, represent the right hand side as the difference of the gradient minus the anti-symmetric part that the mechanics identifies the linearized rigid body motion. So uh, this uh, equation, uh, um, the, the um, how do we call it? C is the, I always forget the name, um, compliance yes. tensor, compliance tensor. The compliance form of the of the Hooke's law of the constitutive equation hides in it not only the, uh, the Hooke's law, the constitutive law, but also the de definition of the infinitesimal um, rigid body rotation. And that is easy to see. If you take the symmetric part of both those equations, Rij disappears and you are left with it's just the inverse form, the compliance form of the constitutive law. But if you apply, if you take anti-symmetric parts uh, of both sides of the equation, to the left-hand side due to the symmetries of compliance tensor is zero, whereas the right-hand side reduces to Rij and the uh, definition of Rij. So, so don't forget about that. There's no miracle here. As you go from here to there, you not only preserve the constitutive law, but you are also adding definition of R, the infinitesimal rotation vector. And then we can formulate uh, our problem as a system of first order PDEs. Uh, mathematicians like to start with the second order system. Um, I, as an engineer, I prefer to start first order system. That's where physics most of the time starts and uh, we arrive at second order equations only through a reduction process. So what are the equations? You have a uh, balance of momentum equations, three equations in 3D. Omega is the angular frequency, rho is the density, sigma is the stress, fi is the body uh, force. Then you have uh, these constitutive equations combined with the uh, definition of linearized strain and uh, uh, linearized rigid body motion hidden in one equation, first order equation also, you have to throw in uh, the condition on sigma being symmetric because now uh, that you have switched here to a larger class of, 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 of stress uh, uh, tensors, this is not in force anymore, anywhere. You have to assume that. And we have two boundary conditions. For simplicity, we'll use the standard displacement boundary condition on part of the boundary and the traction boundary condition on some other part of the boundary. Also, for simplicity, I will assume that the problem is driven only by the body force and the two uh, 
boundary condition data are homogeneous, are zero. This is by no means any restriction. Uh, uh, it just makes my presentation a little bit easier. So uh, you can rewrite the same system using absolute notation, and then you realize that the, this is a classical diff uh, grad problem. Um, the only you know thing to remember about here u is a vector, so grad of u is is a tensor, and sigma is a tensor. So you're talking here about divergence of a tensor that returns a vector. And then uh, we start the variational formulation business by taking our three equations, multiplying it with test functions v, tau, and s and integrating in omega. And once you integrated them in omega, right, uh, I'm switching to the L2 product notation. So uh, these brackets, parentheses, denote simply integral over omega of divergence times V and so on. You end up with what I call strong or trivial variational formulation. Uh, there is no relaxation, there is no integration by parts here. It's just the strong form of the equations that is now understood in L2 sense by integrating with L2 functions uh, and requesting these uh, variational equations to vanish. So it's not the simple variational formulation that we may be used to, right? Uh, uh, the, the, you have a group unknown and a group test function. Group unknown co consists of the displacement, stress, and uh, this infinitesimal rotation vector, uh, whereas the test functions consist of uh, the components V, tau, and S used to test the three different equations. So once you have derive your variational formulation in sort of formal way, paying little attention to mathematics. You have now to put your mathematician's head on and ask yourself the question, what is the functional setting of the problem? Where, what functional spaces uh, these unknowns and the test functions are coming from? And uh, uh, the, the principal tool to use here in context of Hilbert space setting is the um, Cauchy-Schwarz theorem that says that the integrals of this type products are well defined provided both of the guys are L2 functions. So the easy part here is with test functions, they enter the formulation with no derivatives on them. So uh, they uh, simply belong to L2 functions, right? multiple products of L2 spaces. V is three components. Uh, tau is, as you can see, um, nine components because this is a tensor equation. And the last equation is tested only with anti-symmetric guy because we are enforcing the symmetry. So the symmetry in the variational form is equivalent to the orthogonality to uh, anti-symmetric guys. So uh, anti-symmetry reduces the number of unknowns from nine to just three in three space dimensions. It's a little bit more difficult to identify where the solution is coming from. So U uh, has the gradient on it. Remember, this is a tensor, uh, three copies of the regular gradient. And if U and the gradient have to be in L2, then U have to be in the H1 space, because that's the definition of this space that both the function and uh, gradient is L2. Uh, so uh, sigma is uh, a tensor such that its divergence is an L2 function, right? That's again Cauchy-Schwarz at work. And that leads to the assumption that sigma belongs to this H diff omega you can think of that as three copies of the standard vector valued H diff functions. Notice that by adding uh, the enforcement of symmetry of the stress tensor explicitly, we have eliminated the condition that sigma has to be symmetric. Uh, 
there is a possibility of looking for sigma in H diff sim space that requires not only um, that the derivatives are L2, but also that the stress is symmetric. Now we do it for the reason. It is much more difficult to discretize H diff sim space than just H diff space. So I do it for a reason. I don't want the, uh, the, the, the trouble of discretizing H diff sim space. I just discretize the standard H diff space. So that's the strong variation formulation. And uh, uh, we can reduce that strong variation formulation by eliminating uh, the unknown R. And this is in the second equation. And this is done in a very simple way. Instead of testing with uh, general guys, uh, we test only with guys that are symmetric. And if you test with guys that are symmetric, the product of a symmetric and anti-symmetric tensor is zero. Uh, the R is not seen anymore, it drops out. And you have only U and sigma as the unknowns and the number of the equations is reduced. Now, this is the formulation you would like to use. And you might say, so why didn't we do it from the very beginning? Uh, well, uh, this R, as you will see, will enter other formulations. So one reason is I wanted to introduce it, the infinitesimal rotation vector. Now, I, I also want to notice that enforcing the symmetry of tau or S is easy. Because both tau and S are, this uh, come from multiple copies of L2 space and all it does it reduces the number of components of, of these testing functions. Okay, so we have the strong variation formulation and strong variation formulation reduced. Now we go into uh, the concept of mixed variation formulation. And the first mixed vari variation formulation is obtained by uh, taking the first equation, or maybe it's a good moment to start, uh, yeah. The, the, the second copy of the presentation, by taking the, uh, the momentum equation, integrating it over omega and integrating by parts. Now this process is known as a relaxation. Now the relaxation is not only about integration by parts, but it is also about building the boundary condition in to the formulation. Now, when you integrate by parts uh, this equation, then you get a boundary term that corresponds to tractions. And uh, if I had here a non-zero right-hand side in the traction condition, that this traction term will show up here on the right-hand side. But uh, for simplicity, we have it zero, so it doesn't show up. Uh, the only effect here is that we have moved the, 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 the divergence from sigma onto uh, derivatives uh, on V. We get the gradient of V by integration by parts. And uh, we have now boundary conditions, additional boundary condition on the test function. So by moving uh, derivatives on the test functions, we are changing the functional setting. Uh, U is still in H1, but since sigma has no derivatives on it, sigma is now just an L2 function. Sigma is now just an L2 function. R is still an L2 function, but the first testing function V now has derivatives on it, and it has to come from the H1 space. In order to eliminate an unknown boundary term, we also assume that V is zero on the part where the kinematic boundary conditions are, are imposed. So by relaxing that momentum equation, as you can see, we end up with a variational formulation that is, has enjoys a fully symmetric functional setting. 
u sigma and r, v tau and s, come from exactly the same spaces. So uh, this formulation is eligible for um, a standard bubnov galerti method where the trial and test functions are the same. Uh, we immediately follow with the mixed variation formulation reduced. We can do the same thing as we did uh, before. Uh, that is, uh, we can eliminate R and S by testing with symmetric guys in L2 and by imposing the symmetry of sigma explicitly rather than in a weak form. And you again may ask the question, so why, uh, why now you can do the symmetry and in a previous formulation we couldn't? Well, uh, we could, but it would have left to the difficulty in discretization. Now that sigma is coming from L2, enforcing symmetry is not an issue. Because all I have to do is, is take uh, uh, less components of sigma respecting the symmetry, right? So this is still a symmetric functional setting. You're solving for displacement and stress, and you are testing with uh, functions coming from the same space. And finally, we arrive at reduced variational formulation one. And that's the classical principle of virtual work. How do you do that? Well, you still remember that the second equation is equivalent to the strong form. And this one, in turn, is equivalent to our original uh, formulations, where sigma is equal to e times epsilon. And you use that uh, to eliminate sigma altogether. And if you eliminate sigma altogether, then you end up with this classical formulation known as the principle of virtual work, where both u and v come from the space of kinematically admissible functions. And in terms of unknowns, uh, this is uh, uh, on the continuous level the shortest and the most compact formulation, which explains why it, was, it has been in use for several hundred years and definitely the focus of finite element discretization because it involves the smallest number of unknowns. As you will see later, in context of DPG, uh, the cost of discretizing, of solving equations corresponding to different variational formulations, the global cost, the number of interface unknowns will be identical. Let me repeat it. The number of interface terms, interface unknowns, affecting the cost of the global solve using a direct solver will be the same for all variation formulations. And therefore, you are not longer bound to stick with the reduced variation formulation with the principle of virtual work you can use any other variation of formulation uh, that, that you may want uh, for reasons that I will e explain in a moment. So uh, we have a second mixed variation of formulation and this is what mathematicians call the mixed variation of formulation where you keep the momentum equations in a closed form, in a strong form, but you are relaxing uh, the second equation, this combined Compliance form of the constitutive law with the with the uh, uh, definition of strain and and uh, linearized rigid body motion, and by by that you are moving in derivatives on tau, and uh, the sigma and tau now come from the H diff space, but the remaining unknowns are only in L two. Now. Uh, notice that sigma now comes from H diff, so it's not desirable to enforce symmetry in a strong way. You want to keep uh, the last equation that enforces the symmetry of sigma in the, in the weak way. Mixed variation formulation number two. Uh, 
And finally, you can reduce that variational formulation by eliminating this time u. You, you can solve the first equation for u and uh, represent u in terms of sigma and formulate the whole problem in terms of sigma and r. And that's the equation that you get. You still don't have the symmetry for sigma and tau, but u has disappeared. Uh, this is possible only in the dynamic case because you're dividing by omega. So in the static case, this trick of reducing the problem only to sigma and r is impossible. Okay. And finally, we arrive at the concept of ultra-weak variational formulation. So in the ultra-weak variational formulation, you relax both equations. This is like the most relaxed equation ever by moving all derivatives to the test functions. So it's in the spirit of theory of distributions of Schwartz. By doing so, you end up with the solution components in L2 and test functions in now in H1, H diff, and S still in L2. Uh, the name discontinuous pattern of Galerti method uh, was not introduced by us, was coined by uh, Italian colleagues, Bottasso, Sacco, and two other guys from Milano. And if you open their four or five papers on the subject in starting from 2002, you will see that they use the name DPG really for this ultra weak variational formulation, more precisely the broken version of it. So uh, we use the concept of DPG in a slightly different context. We stole their name and we call this ultra weak variational formulation. Uh, the the word ultra weak was used for the first time in context of very special boundary element method by Sassenat and um, oh god another French colleague I'm, I'm a senior moment again and when I apologize to him about stealing the name ultra weak he said, Leszek, don't worry, I stole it from Presso Lyons. So apparently the great professor Jacques Lyons, Presso Lyons, used the, the word ultra weak version formulation for the first time. And that's, and that's what we are using here for, for this problem. So you can have a, a reduced version where you again eliminate S. Um, just a second that I don't say. No, you eliminate, you what do you eliminate? You eliminate, uh, you eliminate S. Yes, you eliminate S by uh, imposing, uh, by enforcing symmetry of sigma in a strong form, which is not an issue because sigma is an L2. And uh, you end up with a, with a formulation now that looks like this, that uh, looks weird because the number of unknowns and number of test functions uh, look different. Uh, you have U, you have a symmetric sigma and R on the solution side, and then uh, you're not, you're testing with two functions, H1 and tau. And that's the formulation that we have used for our numerical experiments that you will see, see in a moment. Okay, now, is that it? Is that it? Uh, the answer is no. Once you start playing this game of different variational formulations, you can introduce many more, many more. For instance, you may not like imposing boundary conditions on test functions, which we did. So uh, here's the classical derivation of the principle of virtual work. You start 
from the Lame equations, multiply with V, integrate over omega, integrate by parts, and you end up with a traction on the boundary, right? Now, that traction on the boundary is partially known because on gamma t is zero, uh, but on gamma u is unknown. So in the, in the usual derivation, we eliminated the unknown by assuming that v, the test function, vanishes on gamma u. You do not test on that part of the boundary. But this is not a must. You can leave it alone with no boundary condition on v whatsoever. Here's h1. Uh, and then what you have to do, you have to identify this traction as an additional unknown. So this is a new concept, right? You identify the traction as an additional unknown. So if you open up my book, you'll find a number of exercises there that I solve with the help of Barbara Volmuth um, that talk about post-processing, mathematical post-processing for tractions for the classical Bouvenot de Lerty method. Uh, you can think of this version that I'm talking about here as a version where you don't post-process, but you solve for those tractions right away. So the unknown is not only you, but the traction on the whole boundary. And you do know, because you have the boundary condition that they vanish on gamma t, but they're unknown and non-zero on gamma u. Right? And this is a good variation of formulation. Now, you may not like it because it's not symmetric. U and V do not come from the same space. The spa definition of space for U includes the, the boundary condition, whereas V have no boundary conditions on them. They're just general functions, H1. But once you accept the fact that you can work with non-symmetric functional settings, this is as good as the classical principle of virtual work. The solution has two components. Uh, the first one is in H1. The second one is in a weird functional space where those tractions live in. I think Professor uh, Daman had already those spaces floating around uh, two days ago. And you still end up with a variation of formulation that uh, can be written in this very compact abstract form where you have a trial space, a test space, a bilinear or sesquilinear form representing the, the operator, the left-hand side of the equation, and the anti or linear, linear or linear form representing the load. And if you have opened my lecture notes on mathematical theory of finite elements, you will see that this is my beloved notation, that equation uh, you will find in all places in the book, right? So uh, that's a compact way we think about variational formulations and we study their approximation and prove things. Points to remember. The first one is that all these variation of formulations are simultaneously well posed. If, if one of them satisfies the in sub condition, so do the other. Now, I didn't show it. There's no way I can show it in a few minutes. But if you're interested, it is in this paper. The proofs are in this paper with two of my uh, former students, Brendan Keith and Federico Fuentes from 2016. So these are well-posed problems. They make sense to, to approximate them. Now, each of these variational formulations will give rise to a separate, different version of DPG method. And the convergence has to respect the functional setting. So it is done in, in, different, in different norms. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're looking at a strong variational formulation, 
that the solution will converge in H1 and H diff. So you control not only the function, but also derivatives. But if you look, for instance, at mixed variation formulation, then you will converge in H1, but sigma only in L2. You don't control derivatives on L2. So the functional setting reflects the type of convergence energy norm uh, in which you expect your method to converge. DPG, this is a comment ahead of time, can be applied to variation of formulations with unsymmetric functional setting. And the final comment for those of you that know a little bit more, the principle of virtual work, the classical variation of formulation, loses its stability when Poisson ratio goes to one half, or in other words, the lambda coefficient lambda goes to infinity. The other do not. They're robust or uniformly stable in nu. In fact, you can put nu equal one half into your code and you are solving the Stokes problem. Why am I talking about that? Because if you are interested in solving a nearly incompressible equation or the incompressible one, then you shouldn't work with the principle of which you work, but the other guys. You should start with the formulation that remains uniformly stable. Now, is this what happened in the past? No, it didn't. People insisted on discretizing the principle of virtual work and work very hard to come up with schemes that uh, remain uniformly stable in the nearly incompressible limit. One of those famous schemes was reduced integration. And then when mathematicians took over and tried to prove that this reduced integration indeed works, the, the, the way they prove it is by identifying that as a mixed problem. So they weigh all around and say, well, you know, it works because it's a discretization of the corresponding mixed formulation. So why not starting, therefore, with a mixed formulation to begin with? and then proceeding, you know, with the discretization of the well post problem. That's a very general comment I would like to make you when you start your research career. If you're interested in solving uh, problems in some limits, you, you're asking for uniform stability, we call it robustness, and you should look for the formulation before you even, you know, start doing any finite elements that remains robustly stable, that is uniformly stable in your limit. This is the case here with all variational formulations except for the principle of which you work. That one doesn't work. Okay, part two. A refresh on Babushka and Bretzky theories and, and a very quick uh, introduction to the concepts behind DPG. So, uh, what I usually start is exactly this variation formulation that we had a moment ago, abstract variation formulation, and the, the banach babushka Nechas theorem or babushka Nechas theorem stating conditions under which this variation problem is well posed. Uh, the reason I have added the bana here to the name of the theorem, because as you prove the babushka Nechas theorem, you realize that uh, the proof is nothing else than reformulation of the closed range theorem of bana. That is exactly 100 years old. That does not diminish uh, credit that goes to Professor Babushka and late Professor Natchez, his very first graduate student, uh, because the identification goes here to the realization that this variational formulation can be formulated in an operator form, 
uh, where the operator is generated by the Berliner form, and it goes from the space U into the dual of the test space. So if you want to analyze variation formulations, you're dealing with um, operators that take place in the dual space, not in the sum Barnett space, but in the dual to the Barnett space. Well, that's not the setting that Banach used. Banach was going from X to Y, not from U to V prime. So as trivial as it may look for a mathematician, I do give a lot of credit to Professor Babushka and Professor Natchez by making this connection. And then the Banach boundless below condition, which is not only sufficient but necessary for the well posedness of this linear equation, translates into the famous in sub condition. That here it is, because the left hand side defines the the norm, the dual norm, and the right hand side is remains the same. So you might say, why do we call it in sub condition if I see only sub? Well, because this condition, if you take inf divided by the norm of u and take with the in, in, in with respect to u, you get the equivalent in sub condition. It's just one form, equivalent form of the in sub condition that I like personally very much because it reminds me, it helps me remember that I'm looking at boundless below condition. And then you recall what Banach proved. Banach proved that for every right hand side, that is orthogonal to the null space of the adjoint operator, conjugate operator, uh, the problem is well posed. And this in the variational setting means that you have to introduce this space of V zeros that do not see use test functions. And your right hand side has to vanish on Vs. This is what we call the compatibility condition. And once you have this in sub and compatibility condition that you can conclude that there exists a uh, unique solution to your variational problem and it's controlled in the original norm u uh, by the dual norm of l. This is the dual norm of l and the, the inverse of the in sub constant is simply the continuity constant. It goes without saying that on the infinite and dimensional level b and l have to be continuous. So this is the babushka natchez theorem, equivalent to the Banach theorem. And the important thing here is the concept of the uh, in sub condition that you arrive at and the compatibility condition. Uh, and then you have the concept of petrov galerkin method and the famous Babushka theorem. So I'm covering here only the um, conforming version. You have a finite dimensional trial space and finite dimensional test space that are subspaces of U and V. When you say conforming or subspace, jean Serre called it internal approximation. You're making implicitly assumptions about the way you construct your basis functions, your shape functions. For instance, in order to be conforming in the H1 space, your functions have to be globally continuous. In order to be conforming in the H div space, first of all, you're talking about vector valued functions, the normal component has to be continuous, but the tangential need not. So conformity translates in a certain uh, continuity, inter-element continuity conditions that you have to enforce when you're constructing your shape functions. So once you have selected these two guys, you make an assumption that uh, they're of equal dimension. Why? Because in the moment you're going to introduce the basis for these two spaces and translate this problem into the solution of n equation with n unknowns. And you want the number of unknowns to match the number of equations to have a square system. So hence the assumption that these two spaces, oh, there's u missing here. Oh, I'm sorry. There should be uh. I don't know what happened with that. 
okay? And then what Professor Babushka proposed was a discrete version of the in soup condition. So it looks exactly the same as before. Look here. Except now that UH and VH come from the discrete spaces. And then, of course, you get a discrete in soup constant that in particle may deteriorate and go to zero. So we're making an assumption that this guy never goes to zero, it stays bounded away from zero. And then if you shoot the babushka nature's theorem, then you know this is just a particular case and you can conclude that there exists a, a discrete solution to your uh, Petro-Galerkin problem and you control it in terms of the discrete dual norm. So Ivo would not get much credit for that result. But then follows the second part, and the second part says that the approximation error, that is the difference between U and UH measured in the trail norm, is bounded by the best approximation error. So WH here is just any guy from UH. So you cannot do better than that times the stability constant. And the stability constant is the continuity constant for the bilinear form divided by this mysterious gamma zero that bounds gamma h. And uh, that result, <coughs> I always make that my students to recite this theorem. Discrete stability, that is this discrete subcondition, and approximability, the fact that the best approximation error goes to zero, imply convergence because then the arrow goes to zero as well. When you when you see this theorem you also can have uh, now a um, understanding of the different role played by trial and test spaces. The choice of the trial space should be dictated by the control of best approximation error. You want to choose your trial shear function in such a way that they will approximate the unknown solution U, based on whatever you know about this unknown exact solution U, whereas the test functions control stability. So you want to choose them in such a way that uh, you satisfy this discrete in subcondition. So that's the Babushka's theorem. The Babushka's theorem is a great fundamental theorem, but it's not constructive. It's telling you what you need to have in order to have the convergence, but it doesn't tell you how to construct this test space. So uh, we're going to do it in a different way. So first of all, I uh, recall now the Bretzi theory. The Bretzi theory for mixed problems is the second after Babushka's so equally fundamental result, 1972. Uh, I'm sorry, 73, famous paper by Franco Brezzi, and he was still a student. <laughs> and uh, uh, it deals with a mixed problem. So you can think of any of the mixed problems that we look at, or at uh, Stokes problem will be the classical example, right? Uh, that you arrive at uh, from constraint minimization problems. You minimize the energy under the constraint represented by the form B, you end up with this system of equations A, B, B transpose, and on top of your original solution U, now you have a Lagrange multiplier. So that's, it's called mixed problem, a mixed problem. Now, uh, the mixed problem can be cast into Babushka's formulation by introducing group variables, U consisting of U and the Lagrange multiplier, V consisting of two components of the test functions, this uh, big composite forms. So notice that I switch here to uh, uh, the, uh, the different fonts for U and V to indicate the, uh, the group variables. And then, the, the single in sub babushka condition turns out to be equivalent, this you will find in my book, it's a full equivalence to two in sub conditions of Bretzky. Uh, the first condition is 
known under the name of La Dejenskaya Babushka Bratsy condition, the famous in soup condition, and it relates the two spaces V and Q. Here it is. The second condition was called by Franco in sub in kernel condition, and it's a it's 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 a oh another misprint. This should have been A here, not B but A, because it involves the form A and involves U0 and V0 coming from the space. Yeah, this should have been again V0, not U0, coming from the space of guys that don't see the Lagrange multiplier that satisfy the, the constraint. Okay, so uh, this is perhaps a, 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 you know, a small curiosity uh, statement that the two theories are fully equivalent. But uh, what I would like to claim today is that not only uh, Bretzi is a special case of Babushka, but Babushka is in a sense also a special case of Bretzi. These two theories are really fully equivalent. So, why do I claim that? Well, if you take now the operator form of the equation, bu equals L, then on a continuous level, you can introduce the residual. Residual is L minus bu. And of course, if the problem is well posed, if you use the solution to this problem, the residual on the continuous level is zero. You got yourself a zero. Now, residual lives where L lives, and L lives in the dual space, so residual is an element of a dual space. And now I'm invoking the concept of Ries operator, Ries representation theory one of, in my understanding, five most fundamental theorems of function analysis. The other four have a banner name on it. Uh, that one was proved by Ries, Hungarian mathematician in 40s, much later. And it says that any element from the dual space can be represented by the so-called Ries representation in the original space, uh, the inverse of the Ries operator and related to the inner product you use in the space V. So along with this residual, we have the corresponding Ries representation of the residual. And in the remaining of the talk, when I say residual, I will use the neuron name interchangeably with the Ries representation of the residual. So the residual is a functional. The Ries representation of the residual is a function, is a test function. And of course, here we look at the linear operator is an isometric uh, uh, isomorphism. So if the residual zero is zero, then so is psi. The Ries representation is zero as well. And if you have a zero guy, then you can throw in any extra equation you like, as long as the right-hand side is zero. And the equation we are throwing in here is the adjoint, B prime psi equals zero. And now, if you go from this operator form to the variational form, then you realize that you have replaced the original Babushka problem with a mixed formulation. Then mixed formulation now introduces one extra guy. That's the bad news, Psi. The good news is that this Psi is zero. On a continuous level, you're solving for zero. This is zero, right? Along with the solution, you, you're solving for residual. Reese representation of the residual. And you have a mixed problem. And when you have a mixed problem, then you have to obey the two Bretzi conditions. The uh, 
first condition is that in subin kernel, and this is trivially satisfied because this is in a product. There's nothing to worry about. The second condition is for, is for this coupling term that coincides with the original Bayerina form. And when you write it down, you realize that you have obtained exactly recirculated, uh, restated the in subcondition of Babushka. So you might say, what's the big deal? I had the in subcondition to, to worry about, and I still have the in subcondition to worry about. It just has been repackaged. Can you tell the practical difference between the two in subconditions? And the practical difference is as follows. In the Babushka setting, Petrogaritin setting, the discretization of U and V have to be of equal dimension. And uh, coming up with a discrete version of the in subcondition is difficult. There is no such a restriction in the Bratzi mixed problem setting. The space V now has can be of larger dimension than U. And as you increase the space over which you take the supremum, it is easier to satisfy this equation. And that's exactly the point about the DPG method or more, more precisely the optimal test functions. Now, I have learned this equivalence from the work of Wolfgang Dahmen and his group. This is not how we arrive at uh, the DPG method with Jacob Alacrician. We arrive at the concept of optimal testing. Uh, but I will not uh, talk about that today. Uh, it is covered in the lecture notes I have sent you. If you're interested, you can, uh, you can uh, read it. Okay. So now DPG in a nutshell, or more, more precisely, petrov galerkin with optimal test functions in a nutshell. Because we, we, didn't, we don't have broken test spaces yet. You take this mixed problem now, here it is, and you discretize it. So you are adding a letter H. Everything is discrete, otherwise, fully conforming discretization. But you do anticipate that the dimension of the test function will be much larger or larger than the dimension of UH in order to satisfy the discrete LDB in subcondition. So if you uh, look at this system now in terms of matrices and you double notation for psi and u as the vectors of coefficients for these functions, then you're seeing this typical mixed problem structure G, B, B star. Now B is your original stiffness matrix. The difference is that for the pattern of Galartin, B is a square matrix. For DPG, B is not a square matrix. It's a rectangular matrix because you have more test functions than you, than the, than the solution unknowns. So this is a rectangular matrix. Here you have B star. And discretization of the inner test product results in what I call the Gram matrix. That's the term used by physicists, Gram matrix, G. So the algebraic structure of the problem is this. And even though on the continuous level, Psi was zero, on the discrete level, it is not. The price for this nice stabilization that you'll see in a moment you pay is you solve for more unknowns. You're introducing extra unknowns because you not only solve for you, but also for Psi. Now, if you eliminate Psi, doing just starting condensation, computing sure complement, then you're getting an equation for you where on the left-hand side, you have the DPG stiffness matrix on, on the right-hand side DPG load vector. Uh, you arrive at what we call normal equation. So this is B, G minus one, B star on the left. 
Now, if G were identity, like it is in the least square method, you will have BB star, the standard normal equation. But in DPG, you have this G minus one inserted, and that makes a hell of a difference. So the overall concept is uh, that instead of discretizing the original problem, you discretize the mixed problem, and then you formulate these matrices, you solve your system, and you proceed as usual. Now, if you write this equation in a variation form, then you arrive at the pro problem of optimal testing, and this is your optimal test function. Okay, so uh, the big practical question here is, of course, I don't want to do this inversion of G. Uh, globally. I want to do it on the element level. The question is, can we invert the gram matrix G and condense Psi out element-wise? If I manage to do this operation, not after assembly, but before assembly, then the only modification compared to standard final element technology will happen in the element routine, not in the rest of the final element technology. Assembly, post-processing, all will remain the same. And the solution, I will do the DPG magic only inside of the element routine. And that's what we are doing. And that leads us to the concept of breaking forms and test spaces. Maybe this is the time to slow down and ask whether you have any questions. Because <laughs> I cover a hell of the material in <laughs> one hour. <laughs> it's a lot of material. So the, uh, the concepts behind DPG are, are rooted in Babushka and Bretzi theories are rooted. And in order to understand where we're coming from, you, you have to make yourself familiar with those theories. And you know, when I teach the subject, that's where I spend a lot of time. Those are classical papers. Uh, there's thousands, of course, of uh, new papers, new theories. Uh, but these classical papers that are 50 years old uh, remain very, very important and fundamental and uh, in my opinion you cannot understand finite elements unless you understand the babushka and Betsy theories okay so if there are no questions i don't hear any i'm going to launch now into the third subject breaking forms and test spaces So do you remember, probably forgot by now, that when I make a pitch for different variation formulations, I told you that you can come up with more formulations than one. Here was the slide. And I used the derivation of the classical, classical princi principle of virtual work to make the point that you don't have to assume boundary conditions on the test function. And if you don't, you end up with this additional unknown. The traction on the boundary. Uh, you can pursue this idea and you can go one step further. Take your differential equation, multiply it with the test function, integrate over a single element, not the whole domain, but single element, and sum up over all elements. In fact, this is the type of preferred derivation in engineering classes. Right? Mathematicians love to introduce the weak form, the variation form, but as an engineer, you know, you may want to do it this way where you do it on the element level, you introduce the concept of element from the very beginning. 
Well, then after you have done all of this, uh, this is what you end up with. And then you integrate by parts on the element level. And as you integrate by parts, you end up with traction, traction on the boundary of the element. Now, if you're following now the classical route, then you're making an assumption that this, this, these boundary terms can be grouped into three uh, terms. One corresponding to the inter-element boundaries, one corresponding to gamma t, the traction boundary, and one corresponding to gamma u. And the usual reasoning goes like this. Let's assume that test functions are continuous. Well, then all those inter-element tractions cancel out. Let's assume that we do not test on gamma u, the kinematic part of the boundary. Well, then this unknown drops out as well. And on gamma t, we know this guy. Let's substitute the known data build the traction boundary condition in, becomes a part of a data load vector, move it to the right-hand side. But you're a free man, you don't have to do that. And in this case, we chose not to do any of those three. We stay with this continuous test function. We do not impose the boundary condition on those test functions. And we do not eliminate it on gamma t. However, the price we pay, we have to identify it as a new unknown. It is sort of a Lagrange multiplier corresponding to enforcing con conformity of test functions. You, you have a different and new unknown, and this new unknown uh, is a trace of HD space is this weird notation here, h minus one half. And it lives on gamma h. Gamma h is a mesh skeleton. Skeleton. It's not, it's the interelement boundaries, the whole mesh. So uh, the testing comes from the broken space, no boundary condition. This h here indicates that that you, you have not enforced any continuity of test functions. But the price you have paid is that in your variational formulation, you have this additional coupling term involving this new unknown, the flux, or if you like, the trace of H diff. And there's a let, let, letter H here next to the gradient of V indicating that this gradient here is to be understood element-wise. So not in the global distributional sense, but in element-wise. What's the point? The point is that in this broken setting, test spaces, you're testing with more guys. The gram matrix becomes block diagonal because test functions in one element have nothing to do with test functions in another element. And if the gram matrix is block diagonal, then we can do this elimination of psi, not globally after assembly, but on the element level before the assembly. This is the magic I was talking about. The price we are paying is we have one additional unknown, the trace of the flux that we have to solve for. Okay. So, uh, I taught you about many different variational formulations. I said they're essentially equivalent, uh, but this is the famous statement that you may have heard of from the animal kingdom. All animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. 
This is almost a political statement these days. Um, and in this context, for a number of reasons, I don't know whether I'll have a chance to go into that, the broken ultra weak variation formulation stands out. This is the formulation where we're solving for u and sigma. And after breaking test functions, we, we end up with two additional traces, one continuous trace and another traction on the boundary. Now, why I, do I claim that this is a special guy? Well, because you look here at, you know, what are your discretization uh, conditions and, and principles and requirements. U and sigma come from L2. Well, L2 has no conformity assumption. Discretizing L2 is a freebie, nothing special. Well, the test functions come from H1, HDIF, but in the broken setting. And in the broken setting means, okay, discretizing one element doesn't have anything to do with discretizing the, the neighboring element. Therefore, it's, it's not a, a big technicality to come up with the discretization of these guys. How about traces? Well, the T, the tractions, come from the, now I become technical, from the trace of ravier thoma elements. And if you have ever heard of ravier thoma elements, then you will remember that traces are discretized with discontinuous polynomials. So there's no conformity assumption here either. The only conformity is in the discretization of the trace of displacement that has to be discretized with continuous elements, but only on the mesh skeletal. So the entire conformity assumption in this context has been reduced to the task of constructing continuous approximation for displacements, but on skeletal tone only. I will come back to that point later. Okay, so in that sense, this ultra weak version formulation is special because you have a uh, minimum conformity assumptions. Okay, a number of points to remember. This is more for specialists. We can break test functions in each discuss and not discuss well posed variation formulation. The formulation with broken test function inherits the stability properties of the underlying original variation formulation. This is the paper with Karsten and Jay. I consider that to be one of the most impo important papers I have contributed to. Very, very fundamental, very fundamental. Breaking test spaces comes at the cost of introducing extra nodes, the traces. A point that I didn't make and I'm making now is with the technology of broken test functions, you can naturally couple different variation problems in different variational formulations in one problem. Look at this paper. Why would you like to do it? I'll give you an example in a moment. The, the point is that coupling different variational formulation is not longer a problem. It's very natural. You just to do it, you can do it in one code. DPG reproduces automatically stability of the underlying continuous formulation and can be applied to variational formulations with unsymmetric functional set. Okay, here I am stretching things a little bit because I didn't talk about 410 operators. Uh, there are conditions that have to be met to, uh, to, to, to substantiate this, this, this claim. 
uh, do not confuse functional setting with the selection of a concrete test norm. Even with the same functional setting, you can come up with different test norms. Mathematicians most of the time are happy just with a norm. But since then the choice of the norm enters uh, the, the formulation, right? You choose a different test norm, you have a different gram matrix, you have a different preconditioning, so to say. Uh, then different test norms will lead to different DPG methods. By the way, you can see here immediately that DPG is informed about your choice of the test norm, contrary to the standard Galarkin that is not. Standard petrov galarkin when the boom of galarkin when you simply test with the same fun test functions, trial functions, you, you, the, the, the discretization process is completely uninformed about the choice of the test norm. So even that already gives you an idea that unless some additional special conditions are satisfied, something is wrong. Because dependent upon the choice of test norm, you have different stability properties. Therefore, your discretization should be informed about the choice of the test norm. This is what happens in DPG. Being a minimum residual method, that part I didn't show, DPG comes with a posteriori estimate building. The residual, you can exercise adaptivity from day one. There are thousands of papers that list adaptivity as a future work, and the future work never happens because of the complexity of the methodology. In DPG, at least my students and collaborators are solving problems in an adaptive environment mode from day one. The moment you put your problem into the code, you have already an adaptive method because you don't have to code and come up with any a posterior error estimation. And because it's a mean residual method, it falls into the category of reads methods. DPG does not suffer from any pre-asymptotic behavior. One can start adaptivity from very coarse meshes, and I probably won't have time to do that, but that we exercise that property very strongly in context of the solution of wave propagation, problems in the large wave number, uh, where the standard Bovnogarki method is only asymptotically stable. You have to start with a mesh that, that not only satisfies the, uh, the Nyquist criterion, but also controls the pollution there. With DPG, you can start with a mesh consisting of one element. Okay, so I would like to say now a few words about how to implement DPG. Maybe this is the place I should say that DPG has been implemented in many codes that are publicly available, uh, including I know the code that is in our hand. Uh, uh, there is a, a code developed at Sandia by my former student. Uh, Base uh, built on top of Trilinos. There is uh, a DPG implementation in the Joachim Schrebel uh, public NetGen and um, uh, NGSolve. And there is DPG also developed in the Livermore Labs. All of these codes are in the public domain. You can look them up. But there's also our code. And th that code is the fifth incarnation of the three-dimensional HP code that I began, that I kept building through my entire career. So it's exactly 33 years since I put together the first three-dimensional HP code with Valdir Grahovic uh, from Krakow. And I would like to, uh, to uh, make some pitch for the work uh, of uh, um, recent work on paralyzing the code by Stefan, Stefan Henneking. He, he, he will uh, present some of the results uh, right this afternoon. That means soon. 
and 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 may may give you a few extra technical details there although i doubt you'll be able to do it in 10 minutes but at least you will see some very impressive computations there so the code that we have supports uh, the exact discretization of exact sequence h1 h college develop two spaces in our discussion, we use H1, H diff, and L2 spaces. We didn't use H curl. You run into H curl when you solve Maxwell problems. Anything to do with electricity or electromagnetics. And then you have a you keep that exact sequence structure on the discrete level uh, by um, providing finite dimensional spaces. Uh, generated using H1, H curl, H diff, and L2 conforming elements, known also as edge or face elements or Nedelec and uh, Ravier Thomas elements. And in particular, our code supports the so called first Nedelec family of elements, first exact sequence that has a distinctive property that the order of approximation from H1 to L2 drops just by one. So you can represent complete polynomials of order P for H1 and P minus one for L2. So, uh, and that applies to elements of all shapes. We have hexas, stats, prisms, and pyramids in the codes. Uh, it's an HP code. It, uh, uh, supports variable order of approximation, variable order elements. The P can change from one element to another element. And it uses special orientation embedded hierarchical shape functions that we published uh, five years ago. And that package containing those shape functions for elements of all shapes and all these exact uh, sequence spaces is a standalone code which you can download from here if you're interested in using that in your own code. Uh, this is a one slide overview of the uh, logic behind the code. It comes with its own geometrical modeler, which unfortunately is not splines, not nerves. Uh, it uses techniques that were originally developed by Professor Sabo in his P codes. The Sandia people call it mesh-based geometry description, MBG description, mesh that uh, provides uh, the, 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 the parameterizations for the whole geometry. The data structure, this is something that I'm very proud of, of over the 30 something years of my uh, career of building those codes has been reduced to just two arrays just two arrays. Uh, one of these arrays corresponds to initial mesh elements only, and it's allocated at the time of the generating the initial mesh, and it's static. Uh, typically, we assume that we start with uh, a small number of elements in the initial mesh, uh, small meaning thousands, but not hundreds of millions. And then a dynamically uh, mod, uh, a dynamic array con containing nodes. Of course, both elements and nodes are objects. By a node, abstract node, I mean here element vertex, edge, face, or element interior. So there's this uh, algebraic topology taste to it that is very critical. Uh, for the understanding of discretization of these exact sequence spaces. The code supports both isotropic and anisotropic refinements for elements of all shapes. A, this is I'm very proud of. Uh, very few codes that support anisotropic refinements. It's very tricky how to do it. And it supports hanging nodes, one level hanging nodes. So one irregular mesh. So um, uh, the uh, I already talked about that, that for the lowest order elements, uh, we use the name H 
uh, edge and face elements because these degrees of freedom uh, live on edges and, and faces. Um, the uh, process, uh, uh, the element, element is viewed topologically as a collection of its vertices, edges, faces, and interior. So this is symbolically uh, represented here. Uh, I believe these slides were built many years ago by Paolo Gatto. I should mention that the current version of the code was built uh, initially uh, in collaboration with two of my students, Paolo Gatto, uh, who I know just left, Ahen, but Stephanie, and, uh, and uh, Kung Ju Kim, who is uh, now an engineer um, working for Sandia. So we view a uh, logically element as a collection of vertices nodes, so vertices, edges into the, and the interior. And the process of breaking element is translated into the process of breaking nodes. So if you want to break a quad element, you break the edges into two edges and the vertex, and you break the interior into four interiors, four edges, and the vertex. And that gives you then elements in the refined mesh. So uh, the concept here of breaking elements is translated into the concept of breaking nodes. Now, from the data structure point of view, breaking a node is nothing else than generating dynamically new entries in the array nodes, and that's what we do. Uh, the only information that we store in this array nodes is a vertical information, tree structure, where for each node we remember its father, and for each father node we remember its sons. No other logical information whatsoever is stored in the code. And based on this tree information, but for nodes, not just for elements, but for all nodes, and the initial connectivity stored for the initial mesh, we have very special algorithms that traverse those trees and reproduce all typical finite element information that you need, starting with a critical element to nodes connectivities. Give me element, I give you an element, give me the nodes of the element. So we never store it, we reproduce it from those trees. And if n is the number of refinements, we do it in n log n at n log n cost. So which means that those things are almost not seen in terms of the execution time, right? So uh, I consider these data structures to be one of the big accomplishments of my life. Uh, they're very unique, and uh, I will try to convince you by showing some of the examples on, on the code. So the code I wrote with Paolo and Kung Chu was still a serial code, a standard sequential code, um, and we were happy to, to be able to... Uh, solve problems up to five, six million unknowns. Now, if you remember this five, six million unknowns is uh, corresponding to elements of high order and HP adaptivity, then this is a quite powerful code already because you can solve very not trivial problems, 3D problems with it. Now, uh, then I started to work. I got a fantastic student, Stefan, Stefan Henneking, Stefan came with a, a background in multi-grid and computational science from uh, uh, Bavaria. Uh, it was in Munich. I forgot the school. And then st studied in Georgia Tech and then joined our program. He's a power uh, house in terms of computing and in, in terms of parallel coding. Uh, it is sufficient if I confess that I have been reduced to just a helper of Stefan because he is really now 
has developed the code, a parallel version of the code beyond uh, anything that I would dream about. Uh, the target architectures include uh, um, architectures like Intel Skylake or Stampede at our uh, Texas Advanced Computing Center. And it's targeting basically architectures that use the concept of compute node or fat compute node. So we're talking up to a thousand fat compute nodes with the idea that each of these compute nodes has multiple cores, uh, maybe a hundred even, and, uh, and quite substantial memory going into uh, at least 250 gigabytes, but up to a thousand gigabytes. That's the architecture uh, that we have targeted with our code. And the, the code that, uh, that Stefan developed works under MPI OpenMP version. The, the OpenMP version was actually developed earlier by, by Socrates Petridis, who now works at Livermore Labs, uh, my former student. And Stefan took it to the next level putting MPI on it. So under this MPI OpenMP, with uh, about 100 uh, processors, 128 processors, Stefan is able to solve problems with one billion degrees of freedom. So with the whole functionality of the code preserved, we went up from 5 million to uh, a billion degrees of freedom. I mean, this is for me a very remarkable thing. And uh, if you do have an access to such machines, then you may be interested in using the code. Uh, Stefan and I are um, writing a sort of a book. It's going to be a third volume to the HP series I wrote with my colleagues many years ago. And the book will come with the code. So it will be both a theory manual and sort of a user manual, academic user manual. Uh, the, 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 we'll, we intend to publish the code with the book. If you want to be a beta tester, let us talk about, uh, let, let us know about that and we'll be happy to make the code available to you. So um, this is reiterating the concept that we have only two arrays, LM elements and nodes. Uh, and the big question was how to go from the, um, the, um, the um, sequential version to the, to the parallel version uh, without killing ourselves. This is, I should say, this is not the first time I, I attempted to, uh, to parallelize the code. Uh, the previous course was, uh, was paralyzed uh, by uh, Professor Martin Pashensky from Krakow, then a postdoc with me for a couple of years in the early 2000s. And uh, uh, we had some success story there, but in the end, uh, I claimed that the complexity killed us. So, so I learned the lesson. The question was how to do it in the most simplistic way. And uh, the idea came from looking at uh, the memory it needed uh, uh, for one node. And in all the attributes for, for a node in this array nodes, most of the memory is taken by degrees of freedom. This is an example of a node in a hexahedral element and the corresponding degrees of freedom for the ultra weak formula, DPG formulation for Maxwell problem. And if you look at the edge node, then you will see that the edge node may, uh, uh, for higher order element, let's say order six, will occupy 80 something percent of memory. But by the time you look at the middle node, the middle node is where most of the degrees of freedom are, are sitting, then you see that for the six order, practically almost 100 percent memory. Uh, is taken for storing degrees of freedom. And that led us to the concept of parallelization. We said, okay, let's keep a copy 
let's keep a copy of the entire data structure on each rank, on each processor, but let's only distribute degrees of freedom. And that's the critical concept that is behind Stefan's work. Of course, in the process of doing that, we had to modify some of the algorithms to enable the, the MPI OpenMP computations and uh, um, and uh, and this is the point he is uh, uh, making here that each node uh, without degrees of freedom has been reduced. We did some additional uh, savings to only sixty four bytes in global memory. Therefore, all the algorithms that we had. Uh, in a sequential version to support uh, the, 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 for instance, element to notes, um, computation of uh, element to notes, uh, connectivities, all of this stays essentially without any change because it involves only the logical information and only the degrees of freedom are, are, are distributed. Uh, load balancing is there. We, uh, after HP adaptivity, HP adaptive re refinements um, depend on the problem. The, pro the, 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 the load balance is, is, uh, is, is affected, and we have to redistribute degrees of freedom. And we do it by interfacing with the well known Zoltan dynamic load balancing library, on this initially written by Mark Shepard from RPI and being maintained by, uh, by Sandia. So uh, this is just one very quick example that I want to show you. Uh, this is Stefan problem solving the Maxwell waveguide. So if he uses mumps, then by the time he hits 768 uh, cores, uh, the parallel efficiency drops to 0.2. But when he uses his own uh, custom-made um, uh, solver, Parallel nested dissection solver, he's able to maintain the 0.7 uh, effectivity uh, in a weak scaling. Uh, and that translates, as I said, again, into the possibility of solving problems with up to a billion uh, degrees of freedom. So, okay, that's all what I wanted to, to make the pitch about the code, because I'm going to be showing you examples obtained with the code. Uh, the sequential version of the code, the uh, parallel work. If you want to uh, see examples, you have to uh, tune uh, to uh, listen to Stefan this afternoon. And the first problem here is linear elasticity. We begin with the standard uh, convergence studies. And, uh, and this is a paper from 2016 with Brendan and Federica that mentioned where we uh, reiterate point of different variational formulations and we study strong primal mix and ultra weak variational formulations for various uh, order of convergence and demonstrate that you, uh, for a problem with a singular solution, you do get optimal rate of convergence and you get it also in the adaptive mode. So you can visit this paper to to, to read, uh, to learn about the verification. Uh, here's uh, computations in pictures. Um, as you can see, the meshes do look slightly different because you are minimizing the error in different norms. The strongest norm is in the strong formulation, the weakest L2 norm is the ultra, ultra weak uh, variational formulation. Another example, and uh, was solved in collaboration with Professor Patrick Letalek from uh, Paris. Uh, this is a challenge problem that Patrick came up with. It's a, a incompressible uh, or nearly incompressible rubber cylinder, rubber cylinder um, uh, contained in a metal sheath. Um, so it's a very thin um, uh, shell and very stiff shell and then this nearly incompressible material inside. So uh, for the nearly incompressible material, we had to use a formulation, one of the formulations 
that remain stable. I mentioned that before. And we use the ultra weak, and then we couple that ultra weak with the standard formulation for the uh, metal sheath, uh, because there there was no issue of uh, stability. And we managed to solve this problem. You can see the tests in that paper and and the, and the results. Uh, here actually the convergence curves shown for different piece. Uh, this is supposed to move, but it doesn't. So just a static few static pictures. Okay. Uh, the second problem that I want to uh, quickly entertain you with was a, a problem uh, dealing with uh, with um, stress analysis of uh, insulators in high energy density motors. So let me uh, perhaps uh, just a second. Uh, let me start with this picture. This was a Navy uh, sponsor project. Uh, um, so here is a big uh, motor, and here is the rotor part of it, and you see burn uh, uh, coils here. And uh, uh, you know when something like this happens, then you have to stop the ship that is propelled by this uh, engine, take out the engine, then take out those coils and painfully repair them. Now each of those coils, right, has a cross section like this, uh, where you have uh, the, the metal copper um, uh, coils, um, uh, this is part of the stator, uh, surrounded with the insulation. So, of course, uh, we are not able to model the whole engine. We were not even in an attempt to model the whole uh, cross-section of a single uh, coil. We just took two of these uh, um, um, uh, copper um, uh, coils and surrounded them with insulation. And, and this is the problem that, that we solved. Uh, it's, uh, it's still mathematically not a trivial problem. You have you you are rounding the corners to have the precise resolution of um, of singularities, and the, and the and and the problem deals with the modeling of the visco thermo visco elastic uh, uh, material um, used to model the insulation. It was done in collaboration with an experimentalist. Who was determining the constants for this material um, in her lab? Uh, so uh, mathematically, this translates into thermo viscoelastic behavior. This is the problem we are solving. The first equation is Lame equations, complemented with additional terms corresponding to the temperature. And the second equation is the heat equation. Uh, the problem is linearized. So in the end, we are solving a linear problem. And we use primal formulations to solve it, as simple as possible. Uh, uh, so uh, no degenerations here, uh, just the, the simplest primal formulation. So on top of the standard, Unknowns, displacements, and the temperature. We have the the, the fluxes, tractions, and the and the heat flux in the second equation. So let me now go back a few slides and uh, say that we started with the convergence verification. So here it is. Um, and it's not it's not trivial because you're talking about nonlinear. Are we talking? I'm sorry. You're talking about the Viscoelastic elasticity um, coupled with a with a with a with a heat equation, and we had first verified the, the expected convergence rates uh, with some manufacturer solution, and uh, once this work, we went on to uh, to do a validation studies, right? Because there was a, a not trivial. Mm, the material here is non-standard, this polymer, and the, uh, we did it by uh, simulating the actual device that was used to, to determine those material constants. 
So how was that in that in practice? You have a plate here that is clamped at the, the both ends, and there's an additional clamp in the middle, and this guy vibrates. And uh, and as it vibrates, you are able to use accelerators to determine the corresponding reaction of this clamp in the middle. Uh, and then once you have the react reaction, you assume the, the Poisson ratio and you're inverting for the uh, Young modulus. Then Young modulus now depends upon many things. Depends upon the frequency of vibrations, depends upon the temperature. This is viscoelastic behavior, and you're going for the uh, the real and imaginary part. Now, that 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 device here comes with a built-in inverse uh, procedure that is based on Timoshenko beam theory, with some custom correction factors. So you know, I never trust those guys. So we said, okay, let's verify that this indeed works. So how we did how did we do verification? We took uh, the viscoelastic constant provided by our experimental partner. We put that into our code. We solved this very problem, and uh, we uh, um, the process of solution, as you can see, you're seeing very notable anisotropic refinements. This is around the uh, the, um, the 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 edges of the clamp to get <clears throat> to, to 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 resolve the stresses, and then we uh, computed the force, the normal force representing the reaction of the clamp, and we were comparing that with the force uh, coming from the experiment, and this is the convergence we got. Linear elements, quadratic elements, both cases you have to use adaptivity. You cannot even dream about the solving this problem without adaptivity. And uh, um, we managed to converge to the, uh, the, 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 the readings of the normal force from the experiment within 5% accuracy. Uh, that made uh, our uh, experimental partner very happy. You know, in HP elements, I am used to accuracy of 0.1 percent. <laughs> so <laughs> I wasn't happy about the 5 percent. But you remember here that inversion procedure is done with this uh, very rough Timoshenko beam theory. Then I guess we should be happy about that. The very fact that two different orders of approximation led to the same values was an extra verification. So. Uh, then we come to the actual study, and the, and this is uh, we study a, a, a few uh, regimes, loading regimes. The first one corresponds to the uh, low frequency where the load comes from the temperature. We look at two materials, epoxy and silicon. This is the kind of pictures you are getting from our code stress distribution. Uh, the mid frequency range. Uh, corresponds to the forcing due to the stator ovalization. So this is a large vibration problems and you're assuming that the stator is, is uh, assuming this uh, particular elliptical like shape. And then this implies then the way the boundary of this little segment deforms. And we use that as a, uh, as a boundary condition. And that's the kind of stresses that you get from there. And the last one, the most exotic one, was Lorentz forces. So I don't know how much you know about the electric motors. Uh, there is a switch in there, and the switching uh, produces Lorentz forces on the uh, a current on the interface between the dielectric and the and the conductor. And these uh, uh, generate nonlinear forces, known as the Lorentz forces. And these guys produce this type of stress pattern is beautiful. It shows the power of higher order elements to resolve distributions like this. Okay. And now if you have any engineers in the in the audience, you tell me which of those three four scenarios turn out to be critical in in other words, with the, which which of those three loading scenarios produce the largest stresses in your engineering intuition. 
Okay, Barak, I'm, I'm afraid you're the victim. You have to tell me. <laughs> so this beautiful high frequency Lorentz force has turned out to be insignificant, orders of magnitude smaller. Beautiful pictures, but they, they are not the forces that produce, that make this epoxy to crack. The largest forcing, the largest stresses came really from the ovalization, from the purely kinematic, uh, uh, you know, uh, forcing on the boundary and overall inertia forces. That was, that was the conclusion and the, the end of the project. Uh, uh, Federico was a very special guy. This was a difficult project. He went through the entire theory of uh, thermoviscoelasticity and uh, implementation, DPG, and learn the physics behind that. The fact that he has both math degree and uh, mechanical engineering degree from Colombia help because it's a problem that requires both uh, uh, knowledge of physics and, and mathematics. Okay, so uh, I, I think I have done the minimum that I wanted to do. Uh, but uh, if you still have energy, then I can entertain you with a, a few uh, more results uh, and concepts. I think we have energy. We are, have planned to, um, what was it, Arvind? Go to five, right? And then we have five. So, so there's another 45 minutes. But we can leave substantial portion for discussion if, if you like. Right. So, uh, so. So I would like to mention two, uh, two, two subjects. Is one is poly DPG, and this corresponds to this uh, ultra weak variational formulation that I uh, right. Where did I put that uh, about the animals? Oh, oh yeah, this slide, right? I pointed to the fact that if you use the ultra weak version of formulation, then you end up with the necessity of coming up with conforming discretization only for displacement traces. That, that is on the interelement boundaries. So that opened up the possibility in 2D of considering general polygonal elements. Because even if you have a general polygon, its uh, boundary is just edges. And constructing a continuous approximation on edges is not a problem. Right? There's, there's no task of constructing discretization inside of such an element. And that led to the concept of poly DPG. So, um, We published a paper first in 2D, and uh, uh, that paper is uh, comes with a MATLAB code that is in the public domain. If you want to play with that, and the subject of this PolyDG became later a PhD subject of uh, Jaime Jaime Mora who is going to speak uh, this afternoon yet. And, and if you listen to him, he will show you some 3D computations. Uh, uh, it was a big jump from 2D to 3D. But here in my presentation, uh, I only have a, a 2D picture. So this is the kind of weird meshes that we look at following the virtual element community. And you have optimal rates of convergence for different orders of approximation as predicted by the theory. You can, this is, this is in the style of Franco Brezzi, right? So you have this weird element that is even not convex. Do you see that? It's, it's, and then you reproduce this pattern many places. And then uh, you, you try to solve, uh, good old Laplace equation, but with such weird elements. 
and you're getting a perfect solution. This is the solution, and these are the convergence rates. So it's quite remarkable because it's a big departure from quite elements. We, one of the motivations on my side was looking at the problem in geomechanics where you have to deal with geological fault. And the idea was, okay, if I have a geometry that I have to respect, then I will just follow with the uniform refinements, a slight distortion of the mesh to fit the interface. Otherwise, we'll cut to those elements. And as I cut to those elements, then I'm getting now weird guys with multiple edges. And uh, here we'll use the poly DPG uh, technology. And yes, again, you can get optimal uh, rate of convergence and, and very nice convergence for these type of problems. Uh, one of the points made already by my students, I should have mentioned that. The leader on this project was uh, um, Vaziri. Uh, he works now for Nastron. And uh, uh, one of the big points that he made that you can now enforce adaptivity without worrying about any uh, constraint approximation, hanging node strategy, because uh, adaptivity produces simply polygons with, you know. Uh, a, a large number of nodes. So, for instance, this is not a constrained edge, uh, but you simply treat this element as an element with two edges here. And uh, that leads to completely different refinement strategies. Uh, this is the, the standard H, uh, H strategy that has been in my codes, and it's, it is in our 3D code. Uh, and this is what the, what the um, poly DPG produces. And the, and the, and the more exotic uh, form elements here. And the, when it comes to adaptivity, this is age adaptivity only, all three strategies give you the same rate of convergence. So the poly DPG can be seen also as a uh, technology to uh, avoid, to avoid uh, hanging notes, constraint approximation business. Okay, the last subject, or maybe last before last, deals with the discrete least squares implementation of DPG. If you take our gram matrix G and you do, do the Koleski de decomposition of it, so L here is um, a lower triangular matrix, and that is adjoined and, and then L then you, you preserve the decomposition for G minus one. And uh, if you plug this decomposition into G minus one, then your DPG problem now uh, can be identified as a discrete least square problem. Where in place of like in least squares matrix B, you have L minus one B times it's a joint. Now, what's the point? Well, the point is the following, that if we can formulate the DPG problem as the discrete least square, I emphasize, it's not the least squares, it's the discrete least square problem, then there are solvers for solving discrete least square problems. The so-called reduced QR method is one of them that uh, never ever form the normal equation. They work on the original rectangular system, L minus one BU equals L. What's the advantage? Well, the advantage is that for the normal equation, your conditioning is of order one over H squared, whereas for the original system, the conditioning of the stiffness matrix is one over H. The price you pay is that, you know, you, you cannot use the standard finite element technology where we form the DPG matrices on the element level, right, turning to the normal equation. And instead, you have to assemble global, so it's a custom code. You have to build a new code. 
you have to assemble global stiffness matrix and global load vector and uh, uh, this, 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 these rectangular matrices and then use a specialized solver. So in our academic environment, this technology was about 10 times more expensive in order of magnitude the standard technology. But the point is that when you look at the conditioning, okay, here are the three typical uh, curves. This, this, this red curve here is conditioning for the standard Galerkin, and it goes like one over eight square. The blue one is for the typical DPG. It has the, exactly the same rate, one over eight square, but it's an order or order and a half higher condition numbers. And that shouldn't be a surprise because we are using more unknowns with the same mesh. The number of unknowns is roughly doubled. So, uh, so, so you're solving larger systems, the constant goes down. But if you are solving that as least squares, you have this green curve. And if the green curve initially is losing to standard Galarkin, then eventually it's leaving, is, is, is winning with a, a condition number only of the order one over H. And this is an example of a problem that we solved using this technology. It was a quasi-resonant uh, problem for acoustics with a hard boundary condition. So if you, if omega, this is, you know, if omega is one of the resonant eigenvalues, uh, frequencies, then this problem has no solution or has multiple solutions. Uh, but here you are in a quasi resonant mode, very close to the resonant eigenvalue, and that produces very ill conditioned matrix. Okay, so uh, how ill conditioned here? Here's an example for p equal 3 and p equal 4. This is what's coming from DPG. This is coming from the least square DPG. As you increase the mesh, and as you can see that this different rate has a dramatic effect because your conditioning here is 10 to power minus six, whereas for the standard DPG is 10 to power 12. So you double the condition number. Now, how does it translate into a practical problem? Well, if, if you're solving uh, uh, the, um, this is again uh, a comparison of standard DPG with the least square, so you're getting the same guys. But at some point, as you uh, as your mesh gets finer and finer, the standard DPG gives up. You're losing convergence; the curves goes up. This is using adaptivity. Now, if you are solving the same thing with the uh, discrete least square as DPG you can do two more adaptive steps in this context and draw uh, and, and drive your uh, relative error, you know, to two orders of magnitude less. So the message is yes, you are 10 times more expensive. Yes, you have to build a new code. I mean, you have to build a new solver. The code remains the same in terms of data structure and everything, but solver has to be built uh, a custom made solver but if you are solving very quasi singular problems very ill conditioned problems uh, this may be uh, for you so um, i'm almost done i guess i went too fast right <laughs> but if you allow me so this is this is the, the close uh, summary of what we discussed today. If you allow me, I, I will show you uh, a few more numerical examples uh, just to uh, um, perhaps uh, impress you a little bit more.
Can you see the screen again? This was a presentation I gave last, last year uh, in Berlin, in Germany, uh, at Humboldt, where we held our fourth uh, workshop on DPG methods. Uh, Stefan was there. So I will uh, save you all the um, theory, but show you some pictures. So this was a different problem, linear acoustics. And when it comes to linear acoustics, uh, okay, you also have the choice of different variation of formulations, uh, but in the context of high frequency wave propagation, as you can see, uh, the DPG ultra weak stands up is very close to standard Galerkin. Uh, DPG primal or least squares, celebrated first order least squares, have very diffusive behavior. So for high frequency problems, you're not going to use the least squares. It's a bad idea because you get this type of solution. Primal is still diffusive. Ultra weak has the least the, the diffusivity. Uh, what I want to show you uh, in, 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 in this context, uh, the um, the DPG in 1D delivers solutions with uh, no uh, pollution. But the point I want to make is in one of the arguments for DPG that I listed before was the argument that being a minimum residual method, uh, DPG enjoys stability from day one. There's no pre-asymptotic. There is no pre-asymptotic stability problems. For, for many difficult nonlinear problems, you really have to start with a very well-refined mesh, respecting physics and anticipated solution before you see any reasonably stable behavior of your, of your discretization methodology. This is not the case with medium residual methods. So Wolfgang may, made already this point two days ago, and I'm reiterating that. And this is an example uh, It started the dissertation work of Socrates. Uh, you're after a high frequency problem. This is, I don't know, about 50 or 60 wavelengths here. Across this diagonal is a problem of simulating Gaussian beam. And uh, if you... Uh, start with a mesh of literally four by four elements, then uh, you, this is not a dynamic problem, this is a static problem. The DPG method automatically is able to refine uh, the mesh and uh, produce the corresponding solution. So in the end of the day, you end up with a mesh that does not satisfy Nyquist criterion, right? It didn't resolve here these elements to the wavelength, right? It only refined the elements that were necessary to support the solution. So if you're solving a wave propagation problem with localized solutions like this one, then this is a great technology for you. Um, the uh, amazing thing is that despite the fact that we don't have a theory for that, uh, the uh, the method uh, practically delivers adaptive L2 projection. Uh, most of the engineering audience, when I tell them this, they still think I'm cheating somewhere. I'm not cheating. We have a technology that delivers the quality of adaptive L2 projection for high frequency wave propagation problem. And you might say, okay, what's the big deal? I can do it with standard Galaxy. No, you cannot. This is what happens if you run my old HP adaptive code for the same problem. The standard Galaxy completely falls apart. The DPG does. So the stabilization is crucial. Uh, uh, the work of Socrates was on uh, building a multi-grid preconditioner for CG, conjugate gradient. And uh, I will not uh, 
uh, talk about the theory. Um, uh, this is a subject for a different talk. I'll just want to entertain you with a few pictures that showing, demonstrating the, uh, the power of this methodology. All these computations were done on a single workstation under OpenMP. So the solution time here goes from minutes to, for 3D problems to hours. This is a problem of scattering a Gaussian beam hitting a, a Helmholtz resonator. The wave goes inside, resonates inside, and then comes out. This problem is about 1,000 wavelengths. It will solve on a workstation using the uh, technology. Uh, and the, this is the complexity of the solver is linear. This is a 3D Maxwell problem, uh, a problem that, that I created as a kind of a joke about, I don't know, five years ago. I call it Fikera oven problem. So, uh, you know, the Fikera, Fikera domain is this cube that you define into, refine into eight cubes and take you one cube away. It's a 3D equivalent of L shape domain. It has three re-entrant edges and one in re -entrant corner. And I knew as a mathematician that if I solve Maxwell equations in a domain like this, um, then uh, I will have very singular solution along these edges and at the corner. But the question was, how do I make any practical problem out of this? And this is where I got help from my great colleague, Ali Ilmas, as an electrical engineer in the institute. And he said, well, let's make a microwave out of it. That's how we arrive at the Fikker oven problem. You attach to one of these uh, cubes an uh, infinite waveguide, and then you feed it with the first propagating modes. And this generates a quasi-resonant behavior inside. So it's a microwave, except that we haven't put anything into the microwave, right? <laughs> It's just resonating inside. Uh, so what you see here is the automatically generated mesh um, using and, uh, multiple refinements and the uh, Socrates solver at work and the evolving solution uh, at various interfaces here. Now, I want you to look at this for a second and realize that for this type of problems with very strong singularities, and Maxwell singularities are stronger than elliptic singularities, if you do not have an adaptive code, you can pack your toys and go home. Because even though we, had, we do resolve here, we do set the wavelength from day one with the very initial mesh, when, when the, on a coarse mesh, the solution is nowhere close to the solution you see on the resolve mesh. So using uh, adaptivity is critical. Now, I'm not saying that adaptivity is the only one way to solve this problem, but if you want to have a general purpose code uh, with which you can solve problems like this, then adaptivity is a must. Otherwise, here is uh, a 3D uh, versions of the area 2D version, again with the adaptive mesh uh, created for the Gaussian beam, uh, is scattering on the sphere. Um, so this is a time harmonic. I mean, everything is time harmonic, but this is a um, and, and scattering on the cube. Again, here the, the critical point is the resolution of the Bounded layer produced by a perfectly mesh layer, PML, uh, without, without the resolution, the solution doesn't look good. And scattering on the cube, uh, the largest problem he solved in 3D, involving about 100 wavelengths, on a workstation. Don't forget that, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, and a similar version for the 
Maxwell, but I guess it's not in this presentation. So there is a solver. It's a multi-grid solver, multi-grid preconditioner for um, CG for conjugate gradient based on the ultra weak variation formulation. Uh, my current student, Jacob Badger, is, is starting to work on generalizing this solver and this entire technology to the MPI open MP code that Stefan developed. Now, if we are successful there, that we are promising solution not only of problems with billion degrees of freedom, but solution of such problems, arbitrary problems, because we're talking linear problems here, in a very finite time. So that's where the combination of mathematics and coding comes together and stability, I hope I managed to convince you, is a critical issue when it comes to solving challenging problems. Okay, Marek, I think I'm done. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Leszek. You will now get a round of silent Zoom applause.